When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we are spirits, not animals. Winston Churchill. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and I am, as always, your host. I hope everyone had a good Easter uh, for those that celebrate, and if for those that don't, I hope you had a relaxing weekend all the same, and that everyone is excited to get back to the podcast. I know that I certainly am. This week, I'm going to be finishing up with the people living in southern Africa at around 10,000 BC. I was expecting, when I was kind of plotting these next couple of episodes out, that we would move, uh, we would focus, begin to shift focus solely on eastern and central Africa. Um, but as I kind of started scripting this out, I realized that, you know, this topic is pretty robust. And uh, the last thing I want to cover about uh, who will become the San people, um, you know, pretty in-depth. And I, I think it's interesting, and I want to kind of go into some detail and get a little esoteric in this episode. So uh, we'll get, we'll, we'll progress uh, to the other parts of Africa next week. But... To finish off the talk about the Sand Peoples, I need to talk about what their religious beliefs, or at least what we think their religious beliefs may have been at this point. Now you may ask why this might be a topic in a history podcast. Well, personally, these types of beliefs and many others shape how and why people lived the way that they did and, you know, why. Uh, so to, to try and understand them we have to try and understand how they thought and perceived the world. And as I mentioned in the last episode, by the time we get written records of these people, they have been in contact with not only Christians and Muslims, they have also had contact with other African kind of religious uh, pantheons and beliefs uh, for, for thousands of years. So we don't know exactly what the original mythology was, but enough of their faith has survived with maybe one or two small details picked up from other faiths or kind of synchronized with other faiths to get a good idea of kind of their original creation stories or at least the ones they considered the most important. Uh, and of course I should point out uh, that the various sand tribes also all probably had their own individual versions of events or practices that set them apart from each other. This was never a centralized, canonized faith. There is no one true story for them. Uh, that's one of the complications in understanding this myth that a modern non-native audience is going to run into. Um, another issue is that it seems all these groups have kind of a general, um, same general outline of the creation story, but they have one creator and then have another creator come into the story or it might be better to consider it a different aspect of the same creator, but be called by the same or a slightly different name depending on the tribe. Um, so basically the name serves more as a function than an identity, uh, you know, a name of the God's name. Uh, so it's going to be easier for us to refer to them as kind of different names, um, though I think in most of the traditions we're talking about, they're different aspects of the same natural cosmic being or force. Uh, some of the names that you run across most commonly are Kang or Kagan, Ko or Thora. I will refer to the aspect that created the worlds at the outset of the creation myth as Kang. And Kang is not generally limited to one aspect or domain of power. Though from what I understand in more modern times, San in the Kalahari and the Namib deserts credit him as being a storm and rain god specifically. Uh, though they wouldn't just limit his power to those you know, domains. Uh, he's much more powerful, but those, to them, those are his most important and beneficial aspects as it stands today. In these earlier times, though, when time frame we're talking about, he is an animating force for all spirits and natural phenomena. It might also make sense to kind of think of him as a shaman channeling various primordial powers rather than some kind of a supreme being. 
Uh, so just a very wise entity, not necessarily the master and commander of the entire world. Now I'm going to give a general outline of events, but please keep in mind that different tribes have slightly different variations or versions of this. In the beginning, there was the original world, the first world. This world was beneath the earth and there was no light. All animals, including man and Kang, lived there, and they could all understand and talk to each other. While this was going on, eventually Kang got bored or decided to create something spectacular, and he labored above ground, and he created a massive tree whose canopy covers the entire world, and he then set the sun in the sky to create light and warmth. He then dug a hole to let the animals and people out of the underworld and told them to all live in the new one together. Once on the surface, he told them that they must all live together, and he warned man that this perfect world would last so long as they never built a fire. Thankfully, the sun was always out and no other source of light or warmth was needed. And that's it. That's the first part of creation done, or at least the biggest part of creation. And I want to kind of get into some of the highlights of this. There was, and supposedly still is, another world beneath ours. Uh, time is linear to this place and to the animals and man and spirits that live there. There is no concept that this is where people go when we die, or that this world will have to be our home again one day. It's not like a linear, or it's not like a cyclical version of time, and then we'll eventually we will return and come back and that kind of thing. And then trying as hard as I could, I couldn't find any story of the creation of humans as a species in any kind of sand-like groups. So that means either that our creation or existence was not seen as mysterious or, or special, um, so or at least it, it didn't stand out from the creation of numerous other animals and there are some animals that do have their own creation story but I just I couldn't find one for humans so it seems we're kind of um, the littlest partner of Kang and the spirits um, but you know that's just kind of what I can find if anyone has an example of the same creation myth for humanity specifically uh, please let me know. Uh, but the humans that are living in this world, they are gonna, they're different from what we are today. And that's something we're going to get into as we continue this kind of story. But that's just the initial creation myth. Uh, now, as for Kang, he is the oldest example of what is known in philosophy as a demiurge. Um, which is uh, kind of used to differentiate a being that creates the world or order uh, from a supreme and all-powerful being that created everything. Um, essentially, a demiurge is something that was born during or after the cosmos' formation as a consequence of that event, and then they shape creation from there. They're usually always a type of craftsman. They're usually associated with like um, weaving or forging or, you know, carpentry or something like that. Um, you know, just in, as an example. Now, despite creating this new world, it does seem that Kang was mostly hands-off of it after he, he created it. He let man and his children do as kind of they pleased. He doesn't use his power to control and rule the world and its people. It is at this point, depending on the group, um, you may see Kang kind of step back or he takes on another more playful or mischievous role or he just kind of observes as he's kind of just being nature itself and he kind of manifests his abilities through different animals or, or you know spirits um, and he becomes more human I think um, after this uh, so this uh, this new form or this specific type of spirit or creator that appears now, I'm going to refer to him as Kagan. 
Um, his, basically, I'm doing this because he is essentially a different being, almost, just because of how he changes and how he begins to have a personality. And I think this uh, this part of his personality uh, is Kagan is more you know popular and more known of a name for him. Um, so again, he, his personality shifts. He becomes a much more active and kind of trickster-ish figure, and he and he still creates stuff. It, it's smaller. It's not on the scale of the World Tree or a Sun, but it, it's important and it, it impacts human lives greatly. Um, so he lives like people and animals do at this time. Uh, he is much more powerful than any of them and skilled, more skilled than any of them. But he, you know, he, he doesn't live. A separate kind of life. Um, he has a wife known as uh, Huntu At Aten, uh, also known as Koti. Um, there is some clicks in that first name. It's like click Huntu At Aten. Um, I, I don't have the clicks down and I, I feel kind of foolish trying to do it that way. So I'm just going to refer to her as Koti. Um, they have their, their own children and they adopt some as well. Um, their sons are uh, are known as, or two of their sons at least, that I was able to get names for were Gewi and Kogaz, and they become chiefs and inventors among humans. And uh, the children that they have are not limited to human or human-esque figures. Uh, they adopt a female porcupine named Jo, and she marries a rainbow known as Kwamanga. Uh, Quam, uh, and he can turn in either, into either a meerkat or a mongoose, and they have a son that is either one or the other, uh, meerkat or mongoose, depending on what the father is. He's the other, um, and it's this might seem kind of like an odd ability, but uh, to the sand, all men at this time could fall into or control animals, or you know turn into them more or less at will. Um, and and Kagan does this too, and he becomes various creatures at various times. He'll he'll turn into small things like a louse or a caterpillar, but it seems like his favorite form and the one he appears most often is that of a praying mantis. Uh, I'm sorry, a praying mantis. Um, his wife uh, becomes a marmot. Uh, so uh, the stories involving this form are his most popular and important. Now, during this time as uh, kind of the mantis spirit and the others, uh, Kagan, he, he creates a bunch of other things. He, he teaches humans rituals on how to kind of um, commune with nature and how to act during certain situations. Um, he basically teaches men kind of all the magic and skills they kind of need to help control or interact with this world. Uh, and medicine men and shamans are extremely important in science society up until the present day. Um, and they are not limited to a specific lineage or anything. Anyone, I think, in the tribe can can learn these skills. It does take study. And there are different, you know, different shamans who have different rituals for different things. Um, so, you know, things like rain dances, not that that's what they are, but they're, they're similar rituals. Um, and of course they have, you know, rituals for coming of age, for both boys and girls, you know, first hunts, things like that. Um, all these things he kind of teaches them to kind of give them kind of knowledge and power over the world. Uh, he also uh, kind of takes some more creation into his, like, hands. He, he creates um, the bull, Elond, uh, or an Elond, just the first Elond, and that's what essentially that is. It's like a kind of a, um, kind of like a deer uh, that's very prevalent and very important in Southern Africa ecologically and, um, you know, food-wise. Um, they were very important to the San, both as a, you know, religious function and for a practical reason. You know, they were they were very popular targets for hunts. And you can see a lot of the San cave art in those areas where they were living feature heavily bull elans. Um, the, the, basically, that these, these are the creatures that God created for them, or Kang or Kagan, however you want to refer to him as. You know, he, this was his masterpiece after creating the sun. And the story involving that is essentially um, he 
his son-in-law for his adopted daughter, Joe, uh, the, the rainbow. He loses a shoe, and Kagan finds it, and for whatever reason decides to fashion it and kind of anoint it and rub it down with honey in secret. And as he's doing this, he's creating this bull wand, and it's it's glorious, it's you know, beautiful, but everyone is kind of wondering where Kagan is and what's distracting him so much. So they send um, his adopted grandson, um, either the mongoose or the uh, the meerkat, depending on again which version of the tale it is, and they have him kind of tell him what he's doing, uh, or, you know, kind of spy on on Kagan. Uh, eventually, he finds Kagan, you know, kind of like brushing this this magnificent Alon's fur with honey, anointing him, uh, kind of creating him. And he kind of reports back to his uh, his family, and they're kind of upset and or jealous, and they decide, well, you know what, I don't, you know, this isn't cool. We we should we should get rid of this thing. Who knows what it's going to do? So uh, they go and they kill it and hack it to pieces. However, when this happens, uh, Kagan comes to them and he is very furious and upset uh, so to kind of make up for it he orders them to um, uh, gather up uh, the animal's blood put it in this giant cauldron or pot and they begin stirring it up and uh, I think some during this period uh, there's a story among some groups that this is where snakes are created like some of the blood gets on the ground and the snakes pop out uh, and they're referred to by some as Kagan's people. And I think in some stories, one of his daughters marries a snake from this. Um, but, and uh, this whole time, you know, they're stirring the pot, getting it, you know, getting it ready. And then he takes the Alon's heart and he throws it into the pot and he does his, his magic or his uh, spiritual connection. And he multiplies, uh, basically makes a huge herd Alon, and this is the founding herd for all Alon in the world. Um, they're not as magnificent as they could have been, but they're still pretty damn good, and they're extremely important to the sun. Uh, so, uh, from that, um, that is how the Alon, this very important animal, is created. Uh, during this same process, um, uh, Kagan is kind of you know, pleased with himself and kind of, you know, enjoys this. Uh, but he, he finds the original Alon's gallbladder. And he's like, well, I wonder what I can do with this. And he, like, for either he or, you know, again, depending on the the group telling the story, something happens that caused the gallbladder to rupture. And from that, a terrible darkness fills, um, fills the world. Um, and... It is this darkness that causes humanity to kind of lose, you know, you know, lose their faith, or at least uh, become desperate for warmth and light. So they create a fire, um, which is something Kagan, of course, told them that they could never do. Um, but uh, from this, uh, he kind of and it, this fire, I think, eventually gets out of control. It kind of burns everything, including the spirits and Kagan himself. Of course, um, Kagan is immortal, and he eventually comes back and kind of, um, he's very upset about this, and a lot of the spirits are burned. So as he's kind of restoring everything to how it was, his sons and humans are kind of getting control of this fire, and this is how we learn to not only create, but how we control fire. This is kind of that story. Um, so to kind of offset this, Kagan creates the moon with his own shoe. Uh, and then, um, you know, from that, and once the fire is kind of returned to control, uh, the sun comes back. And of course, the sun's very upset to see this moon has kind of supplanted him. And he begins to chase the moon across the sky. And eventually, he does catch up with the moon. And he kills the moon, but the moon is able, because it was born with the power to resurrect things, it, it's able to come back to life. So eventually, um, he grows back from his backbone, is the story that the San tell. Uh, so, um, 
you know, basically every day the sun's chasing the moon down to take kind of vengeance, and the moon just keeps resurrecting himself. And this is causing a lot of problems along with the fire, and Kagan just kind of gets pissed at everybody for all this, you know, just all this stuff he's having to deal with. So he kind of relocates his house to the heavens, and he eventually just leaves. Uh, he takes his, I think, his wife, and uh, though I think some of his children remain behind, he himself is kind of, he retires, essentially. He's basically like, you know what, you guys don't deserve me. You don't deserve, you know, any more of my excellent and wonderful creations. And we kind of have to make do with what he had already given us. Uh, also, this fire causes humans to lose their ability to transform or control animals and communicate with them. And any humans that were in those animal forms, when this happens, they are now stuck as animals. So this kind of creates the final divide between humans and animals living and communicating together. Uh, it's a very sad event. Uh, and, of course, we have to deal with the fallout of this. Um, but those are the big parts of the myth and the stories that the San tell about the creation that have kind of stuck with them. And um, there, there are other stories, of course. I mean, there's you know thousands, I'm sure hundreds of thousands of tales probably. Um, but uh, those are the big ones. And uh, there is kind of a... Um, Kagan does kind of have an enemy quote unquote it's not a Satan it's not like an allegory to a Satan or a you know a, a you know an opposite to him um, this deity is called a couple different things to, again depending on the group it's either Gauna or Gawa or Gawama and he's the leader of the spirits of those that are dead um, and he's he's far weaker than you know uh, Kagan uh, he's never a real you know Never a real threat, and he seeks to kind of disrupt um, the creation and harass both men and animals. Um, and again, this is this probably is like the San kind of recounting, like um, you know, maybe a an outgroup that you know this is like their you know that the um, basically an enemy pantheon or a pantheon of people they just don't like, um, but. Uh, this, the Bushmen definitely believe in spirits and, you know, the dead haunting them. And even even family, like, you know, they can be dangerous. You know, past, you know, ancestors who have passed can be malicious. Um, and they can drag you into the netherworld. So, um, again, and one of the things Kang, uh, Kagan taught them was how to have proper conduct um, and they, you know, taught them communal rights and exorcisms. So, and that all that can be used as defense against this um, kind of pantheon of the dead. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the next big factor of creation. Um, you know, some of the big factors in this is, um, yeah. So obviously, in the San version of events, God is. God has abandoned us in the sand version. Um, he gave us kind of what we needed, and he didn't like how rowdy and, you know, how much we were getting in the way. And it's not just humans. It was also the fault of these other spirits and his children. Um, all of this together kind of makes him seem like a very exasperated, crotchety old man. Um, but, again, he is kind of nature personified. So, you know, his aspects do kind of you know, still have interactions with humans even after he moves. He, he, he Again, he's a trickster. He kind of comes and goes as he wants uh, with, you know, he'll appear as, you know, again, small animals usually. Um, and, you know, he, he, you know, he doesn't live with us anymore, but he's still kind of, every now and then he pops in and he, you know, he, he tries to help us as best he can. But, of course, you know, humans and animals are going to do their own thing too. Um... But yeah, so I think, um, obviously this is probably the running for the oldest religion, uh, for lack of a better term, or at least the oldest faith. Um, and again, it was never organized. It's never been codified. Uh, you can't do it with just the number and the, I guess, the 
uh, spread out nature of the sun, um, and even after, um, you know, they were forced to kind of live much closer together, it's still something that hasn't kind of been um, syncretized with all the different groups. Everyone still has their own traditions and things like that. Um, another big factor in this, and this is something that you see in a lot of the early um, European accounts of these people, uh, they are considered to be moon worshippers. Uh, the worship of the moon uh, at some point was very important uh, because the moon, of course, can resurrect. Um, he, was, he would share that knowledge and power uh, with humans. Um, and eventually, just due to lack of faith, and there's, uh, there are a couple different versions. I think the one most common is that essentially a child doesn't believe the moon when he says his mother is going to return to life. And eventually gets so fed up with trying to explain to this child, you know, what's happening. Uh, he just, he, he basically removes our gift of uh, resurrection ourselves uh, for all of eternity. Um, but he's, the moon is still important as a matter of, you know, healing and rebirth and that kind of thing. Um, so it's involved in a lot of rituals and probably um, prayer and uh, dances and shamanistic practices. Um, so yeah. San religion, very decentralized, obviously, uh, very naturalistic, uh, not a lot of fire and brimstone because it's already happened, essentially. Um, it's very much like, hey, this is the world, you just got to live in it, um, and we know how things happened and why things are the way they are, but, um, you know, that's the way they're, they're going to be because, you know, Kang has left. Um, you just got to be respectful and you got to watch out for the dead and you've got to, you know, uh, kind of play with what we got. Which, you know, um, there's something to be said for that, I think, in terms of um, powerful faith. You don't have to worry about, you know, an apocalypse. The apocalypse this century has already happened. So you just got to keep living uh, and be respectful to the spirits and your ancestors so they won't drag you to the underworld or, you know, turn you into an animal and make you stuck in that shape. <laughs> so uh, it's a very interesting set of faiths. And um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's fun. I think it's important to understand that about them. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, we'll of course get to other uh, faiths and groups as we get there. Um, but yeah, so this episode has been going for almost 30 minutes, so I think this is a good point to kind of call it a night. Um, I do hope everyone has enjoyed, and I hope, again, that you have had a good week off, both um, from the podcast and a very restful Easter uh, weekend if you practice. And even if you don't, I hope you had a relaxing weekend as well. But I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Uh, next week, uh, I will probably continue on this uh, kind of story. We'll be focusing again on the Eastern and Central African groups that we have. Um, I'll, I'll go into the, um, the Khoi Khoi, uh, which are again are the modern day. They are the um, shepherds and herdsmen of southern africa and uh but in 10,000 bc they were more in the east and the very southeast um because they haven't been displaced and then again they haven't picked up um herding at all either they're still doing hunter gathering the same way the san are but they have their own kind of uh, faith and um a pantheon and it's it's a little bit different from the san at least different enough i'll, I'll mention a little bit and then we'll introduce some of the other Eastern and Central African peoples. But again, I uh, thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed. You can reach me at my email, at, which is waradrevpod at gmail.com, and I will include a link to our Twitter feed in the description of this episode. And yeah, thank you guys for listening. I hope you have a good evening and a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye.